I will tell you that years ago I looked at Faith Therapeutics. It was a very, very different company than the company that you and I discussed earlier this week. If you'd take a few moments and kind of give us all an introduction into what is Faith Therapeutics today. Yeah, absolutely. I'd be welcome to. Um, I'd be happy to. So first off, I mean, just it's great to be back again this year. As I reflect on this intervening year since I presented here last, last year, it's just really exciting to see the growth in, in the cell therapy uh, field. And I think one of the things that really strikes me that a lot of the momentum is really driven not just by technological advances with any given technology, but especially the convergence of different technologies. That's where really meaningful uh, therapies are being created. And I think gene and cell therapy is a great example today. If I had to predict the next three years, you're gonna see a lot more of that. So with a proper disclosure of, um, of you know, forward-looking um, nature of my comments, let me briefly tell you what FATE brings to the table and what we have really been working on, uh, especially over the last several years to really um, you know, further develop um, a, a new technology. And, and really when you think of this, we're not doing gene therapy to cells or genetic engineering of cells, think of us as a company that pharmacologically programs or enhances cells. We believe that there is a tremendous opportunity across the cell therapy field, and in particular, our focus on hematopoietic cellular therapies, to improve patient outcomes by optimizing the properties of the cells that we're actually administering to the patients. So what you're looking at here is actually on the left-hand side, confocal microscopies of a single hematopoietic stem cell or CD34 cells. That's what these cells look like today when administered to a patient undergoing a hematopoietic stem cell transplant or administered to patients you know, with ischemic conditions where CD34 cells are being used. We fundamentally believe that if you want these cells to home and engraft in the bone marrow, or to go to sites of ischemic injury, or if you want these cells to go in and actually uh, elicit an important immunoregulatory response, that there is a tremendous opportunity to optimize the very mechanisms that these cells actually engage to naturally exer exert these conditions. So what you're seeing here on the right is, for instance, a substantial upregulation of CXCL4 that is absolutely critical to the SDF1 gradient for these cells that tells these cells exactly where they need to go, how they get there, and, and what to do when they get there. Likewise, we just unveiled um, last, at the last earnings call, a new program that is massively upregulating PDL1 on the cell surface of one of, uh, of these cells. So, again, a, a tremendously well validated um, mechanism that we believe we can harness if we want to harness the overall therapeutic potential of CD34 cells. So, let's just stay on that slide for one quick sure. second. So, but how are you able to, what are you doing to the native cells? Are you taking them, or is this autologous? and you're applying an ex vivo process to the cell and then causing the upregulation of CXCR4 or the upregulation of PDL1. And you probably yeah. saw Raul talking about yes. using a, a plasmid to upregulate the expression of SDF1 yeah. in yeah. vivo. Help, just help me describe for Absolutely. me this process. So think of this as pharmacology. The, the beauty of this approach is that it's a very simple, versatile, broadly applicable approach to enhance the therapeutic potential of cells. So we are literally taking these cells, we are completely agnostic to the cell type, we are focusing on allogeneic cells today in the clinic, but there's absolutely no reason we couldn't do this with other cell types. Um, we're exposing these cells for a matter of hours to small molecule or biologic modulators. Um, alone or in combinations, we have seen very powerful results with dual or triple combinations. We have screening efforts that allows us to look for double and triple combination of small molecules. Within a matter of minutes, these uh, small molecules bind to known receptors on the surface of these cells. Gene expression profiles get turned on. Within a matter of hours, you see profound changes in the cell surface expression, the cell surface protein expression. And in fact, what you actually see here visualized within just a matter of hours of exposing these cells to these small molecules, um, the upregulation of these proteins. Now, very importantly, the small molecules use alone or in combination actually gets washed off. They never go into the patient. This is ex vivo programming of the function of these cells. And it is the pharmaco pharmacologically programmed cells that you see here that are actually gonna be administered to the patient. So you're, you're really taking the, so did you say allogeneic cells though, or are these autologous? Yeah, so um, the clinical stage programs, we have established clinical proof of concept that a pulse treatment of cells with this approach can drive clinically meaningful uh, um, benefit in the setting 
of the allogeneic transplant setting. Well-established medical precedent, um, million procedures done, um, actually sort of hundreds of thousands in the allogeneic setting. Uh, and we have shown that we can improve engraftment outcomes uh, as well as we are seeing some very intriguing T-cell related mechanisms play out in the clinic. Early days, small numbers of patients, but we're very excited. What you're looking at here is CD34 cells as an example. I could show you very similar pictures of T-cells where we up or down regulate cell surface proteins on T-cells. So I assume that the, one of the target focus here is initially bone marrow transplants better in graftments, but you, this technology is applicable way beyond that. Yeah, and if I could fast forward just yeah. to our pipeline, this gives you actually, I mean, this is just, again, this sort of very simple paradigm matter of hours. We do this on-site, very attractive cost of goods. Here's the clinical proof of, of concept data. Um, but really looking at the pipeline, uh, we have several development stage programs um, that are focused on applying this platform to improve outcomes in patients who are al undergoing allogeneic hematopoietic stem cell transplant, both for hematologic malignancy, where we're in phase two, and also, and that's perhaps not fully appreciated, there's over 50 rare genetic disorders where allogeneic hematopoietic stem cell transplant, in particular cord blood transplant, ha has the potential for a one-time transformative intervention. And so one of our clinical uh, studies that's on tap this year, which we call the PROVIDE study, is actually focused on the first set of those inherited metabolic disorders, or rare genetic disorders, and we are focusing on specific inherited metabolic disorders. And the really exciting thing for us here is, we have shown that when we do the CXCF4 regulation uh, on the CD34 cells, not only in preclinical models do we get more cells to more robustly go to the bone marrow and engraft, but we have also seen a several fold higher proportion of CD34 cells and make it to the brain and provide long-term engraftment and cellular enzyme replacement therapy in these uh, conditions. Uh, and the kind of conditions we're talking about here are Hurler syndrome, Krabbe's disease, and various leukodystrophies, where, again, the power of cellular therapy is, and this was co commented on in an earlier presentation this morning, you've got to get enzyme to the CNS. And that's something where traditional enzyme replacement therapy is not going to cut it. Um, and there is very good precedent, clinical precedent for use of cord blood transplant in, in, these, in these children who really have no uh, additional options. So we're very excited as this is the third trial that's on tap. We have all of these three trials read out, uh, we uh, expect in, in 2015. So Christian, slow down with me a little bit so I can understand the mm -hmm. business model here. Yep. So if I'm in a bone marrow transplant center and I'm using cord blood or I'm using al adult uh, allogeneic uh, stem cells. Yep. Uh, what happens? Uh, once I have my harvest, do you do you come in? Does a does Faith Therapeutics have a product with instructions that a lab technician uses? But but at some point, I assume there's a process that occurs. Yes, absolutely. So for, first off, just as a, a small sort of, it's typically called bone marrow transplant. When I clinically trained, this was in fact bone marrow transplant. Today, 80% of allogeneic hematopoietic stem cell procedures are actually not derived from bone marrow, but they are used from more modern cell sources, cord blood and mobilized peripheral blood. But to your question, Jason, um, what happens is in the case of cord blood, which is our lead clinical program, the physician actually makes the choice. There's a donor search. There is tens of hundreds of thousands of cord bloods that are you know, available for search in a, in a global bank. Um, and the physician actually makes the choice of selecting a cord that actually is properly HLA matched to the patient. That cord then actually gets procured to the site. And what happens today is on the day of transplant, when the patient is fully conditioned, the cord blood unit gets thawed, washed, and immediately infused into the patient. That happens at the cell processing facility of these centers. What we do is we fit right into this work stream. And after the first thaw and wash, we then add the modulator in this case, in our lead program, it is one modulator. Incubate these cells for two hours with this modulator. Do a second wash to remove the modulator and send in the cells that you saw on the, on the, on the earlier slide. And we have actually worked, we, we're actively, our phase two program is at 11 of the leading transplant centers. So we have worked both with FDA and with the centers to make sure we're doing this in a standardized, reproducible um, fashion. And we obviously have the necessary quality uh, systems and, and on-site technical personnel to make sure this gets So done. it's very clear to me that if you're successful, you get a better engraftment rate and a better outcome. But, mm -hmm. but when I think about cord blood, I think about that I often don't have enough cells and I end up with mismatched cords. Do you impact that modality as well? It's very much a possibility. So our phase two program right now isn't the double cord blood setting. That is the current standard of care. Um, um, 
there is absolutely a possibility that by enhancing the pro properties of these cells that you can more get more patients to actually um, engraft robustly the single quart setting, and that's actually the standard of care in pediatric patients, um, which are included in two of our trials. And, and should I think that you're going after proof of concept with cords, but that the larger market today, as I understand it, actually is not cords? So is there, you're looking to yes. kind of to help me understand yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, explain to everyone what I'm talking about. Because I'm not sure I know. So, it was important for us to establish clinical proof of concept for the overall platform. Is it possible to ex vivo pulse treat these cells for several hours and drive a clinical meaningful benefit? We have elected to do so, and I think successfully done so in the cord blood setting. We absolutely have conviction that we can apply this platform to develop optimized programmed therapeutics within the allogeneic transplant setting. We just announced that within the allogeneic setting, we have a second development stage program that's focused on mobilized peripheral blood. That is the most common cell source. The two of them, cord blood and mobilized peripheral blood, make up about 80% of the allogeneic transplant procedures. So we think we can grow this business and make this a standard of care to program and optimize these cells in the transplant setting. And then in addition, we absolutely have no reason to believe this pro process or, or technology would be confined to the transplant setting. In fact, our research programs are all about actively screening for modulators to improve properties of CD34 cells and T cells that could be used as isolated therapeutics well beyond the um, um, allogeneic transplant setting. And in fact, that's not just our belief, that is actually our research strategy um, to develop these programs. And the PDL1 program, CD34 cell, that, that I just showed you earlier, uh, is one of the first program actually that we're currently actively investigating. Okay, so, so d and just to make sure I understand that, what we're really talking about is being able to, on an allogeneic cell, program it for the upregulation or expression of PDL1 and then allowing that cell to go in and do what? Does mm -hmm. it transfect T cells? Does it, 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 does it change humoral immunity? Help me understand the modality by what happens to that cell once it's in the body and expressing or upregulating, yeah. whether it's CD34 or PDL1 or, you know, that yep. sounds like a mes, and I don't normally think of a mesenchymal cell as expressing PDL1, so. No, but I mean, I think as, as you well know in the field, there is certainly an interest in looking at the po potential of cellular therapies, whether that's mesenchymal or, or hematopoietic in nature, to you know, have an important immune regulatory um, you know, property and potential therapeutic application. PDL1, without any question, is a key regulator, immune regulator. And I mean, again, this is clinically and now commercially validated with the um, uh, um, you know, immunocology program. Um, so what we, are, uh, what we are seeing in early preclinical models is that when we actually contact these PDL1 upregulated C uh, CD34 cells with T cells, in a mixed lymphocyte reaction, we are seeing considerably less reactivation um, and proliferation of T cells. So the notion or the concept being that if you have a condition, say an autoimmune disease or you know, graft or the host disease where you are trying to um, control aberrant T cell activity, um, uh, allergenic t um, or immunoreactive T cell activity, these cells will home to the sites of injury and by mechanisms of these well-established mechanisms keep some sort of these T cell populations in, in check. It's early preclinical data. We're very excited about what we're seeing so far, uh, but there is a lot more um, biology and data to be generated, of course. Okay, so thank you. In the remaining two minutes that we have left, close with me on, you, we have this you know, slide in front of us about milestones, but help me understand, what do you hope to achieve in the coming year at Faith Therapeutics so that I should believe there's a value proposition in the company? Yeah, actually, I will go to the next slide for that. So when I, when I look at sort of the long-term company that, that we intend to, to build and that we are well in the process of building, we have spent the last seven years really building a leadership position in cellular programming. We have a foundational IP estate that we have built. We have the platform technology, screening capabilities, and the like. We are in a very important you know, sort of time frame, exciting time at FATE right now, very, very data rich year. Um, and we have now really applied our platform with double and triple modulation to other, to other mechanisms and other cell types. So when I sort of think forward and the goals that we have set as a company, we want to be a leader in establishing and really driving patient out, improved patient outcomes by applying these sort of taking this era of sending in cells that are unoptimized um, and actually improving the properties of these cells. And we think we can do this by developing products that we can own ourselves, 
So that's our R&D strategy. Um, we think we can, this is a highly concentrated market that is absolutely uh, tractable in a capital efficient way. But we also uh, have a matching business development strategy that matches our R&D strategy because we believe that our platform can be very applicable and useful to other cell therapies and other including companies that are you know, presenting here at this conference today um, um, that we would not necessarily invest in building this technology, but we might partner with companies that, um, that are actually doing this. Very pioneering work. It's very exciting. Christian, thank you so thank you. much for joining us today. I appreciate it. Thank you.